What if there were nothing to defend? Can you wrap your head around that just for a moment? I mean, how could it be that there could be nothing to defend, right? Can we imagine that for a moment? Could it be that we could actually give up the defenses of our families, our communities, our country, our environment, our rights, all that stuff, our egos? I know it doesn't seem really like a vision that could be realized, but if for a moment we could just be with that, to feel into that, what would that feel like if we had nothing to defend? If we had nothing to defend, I, I, I feel a sense of freedom. I feel a sense of, of a loss of, of angst and stress and worry, all those things we talked about that are gonna be addressed in the workshop this afternoon. Like just, just letting those things be to rest them down by our sides and to be open and free. I know it seems like it might not be reachable, but you know, in unity, we're dreamers, right? <laughs> and so if we can just hold that vision for a moment, if we can just imagine for a moment what it would be like to live without defense. I think it might look like a really relaxed environment, a fun environment, an engaged environment, a place where we weren't afraid, right, to fully be ourselves, to fully engage, because there was, there would not be that fear of other or that fear of conditions if we were in that kind of, I mean, that fears may come up, but we wouldn't have to pick up the shields and close the doors of our hearts in that kind of defensive position. If we could live into that, lean into that, imagine what we could create together. And you know in unity, all of our, and new thought in general, everything that we talk about like that, when we cast a big vision for the world, it starts with us, right? We sing it every, every week, The peace begins with me. The peace that we envision for the world, it begins with me. It begins with my inner work, with my um, sometimes hard work. And so what if then the question becomes, what if I drop my defenses? Huh. <laughs> right? Easier said than done, because right now maybe you're feeling really relaxed and you're just listening to a, a talk and you're tuning in with your community and so there doesn't feel like anything to defend. But if you imagine yourself in a heated argument, then suddenly there's something a little bit tense there to imagine just keeping your defenses dropped, right? But if we can hold to that, if we could hold to that, then what would be the met need that we would have if we were living in a place where we didn't defend all the time? That met need would be safety, right? We would feel a sense of safety. Now, I've met people in my life, and I bet you have too, and you might be one of these that really doesn't ever feel safe. You walk through life with that, that core belief that I am not safe. And we all have our own core wounds or core beliefs. You know, there are some other common ones or things about worthiness or inadequacies. But, you know, that, that idea that there are so many of us walking around feeling unsafe all the time. No wonder we have all this conflict and dis-ease and discomfort and otherness. Because that's a lot to keep protecting, right? And to move about the world in that constant state of defending, but I believe that if we hold this kind of vision and we work together and we support each other and we do our inner work, we can actually achieve more of that kind of world. We can achieve that place where we don't need these defenses. We, there would be nothing to defend, right? One of the great teachers of a way of being in this sort of defenseless, open stance kind of shared experience are the teachings of nonviolence. Now, Jesus and other spiritual masters, of course, taught nonviolence, but the contemporary, relatively contemporary figure that we think of when we think of nonviolence is Mahatma Gandhi. Because Mahatma Gandhi made, made a work of his life around nonviolence and, made, you know, and, and had great success with it in South Africa and in India, his native country. And he applied that mostly in getting Indians rallied behind winning their independence from British rule. But even within India, he applied and helped people see the, the power of nonviolence. 
But what's really important, I think, for us to get, because in today's world, we are so polarized and so politicized that anything that sounds like human rights suddenly sounds like it's got to fit into a left or right. And it's, I think it's heartbreaking, actually, because the spiritual roots of this work is what could bring us together to make really good change. So ahimsa or nonviolence in in um, in Gandhi's language is is got a spiritual root underneath it called satyagraha, and satyagraha is Sanskrit. Satya means the truth, and graha means to hold on to or to grasp. And so, if you put them together, then satyagraha is holding on to the truth. And he also called it sometimes soul force or love force. John Lewis, who was laid to rest this week, a congressman who gave much of his life to civil rights, spoke about the spiritual roots of the civil rights movement in our own country. Of course, Martin Luther King learned from Gandhi and applied some of these ideas of nonviolence that came originally from these spiritual masters such as Jesus. And this is what John Lewis had to say. He said the civil rights movement grew out of a sense of faith, faith in God and faith in our fellow human beings. He said during those early years, in the early days, we didn't study the Constitution and the Supreme Court decision of 1954. We studied the great religions of the world, he said. We discussed and debated the teachings of the great teacher, and we would ask questions such as, what would Jesus do? We felt that the message was of love. The message was of love and action, not of hate. And so we believed that if someone hits you, you don't strike back, you turn the other cheek. We were prepared to forgive. The Constitution doesn't teach about, uh, about forgiveness, he says, but it's scripture that's about reconciliation. So the movement, he says, it was based on scripture. It was based on the teachings of Jesus. It was based on Gandhi and others. We saw ourselves doing the work of the Almighty. Segregation and racial discrimination were not in keeping with our faith. And so we had to do something. Our involvement was an extension of our faith. And so it is regrounding in that, if we can ground together in that, no matter where we find ourselves in, in the political realm, I believe that through our spiritual roots, we can join together in, this, in, in social change in a way that is, is, is about faith. As people of faith, that's our strength, isn't it? And I know in our strength, we care. We have great, deep compassion for one another. We all want everybody to have a sense of equality and fairness in their lives. And we all have different perspectives on that. But that doesn't mean we can't draw forth the strength from this root, satyagraha, the sense of soul force or love force. So Gandhi in, in India, as I mentioned, he did some work for the Indians amongst themselves, and one was th trying to help them dismantle the caste system. In the caste system, there are five different castes, and the highest caste are the Brahmins, the educated and the priests um, in, the, in the society. And the lowest caste, you probably know this, are called the untouchables. And you can tell from even the, the title that, that it is this distancing that happens. The untouchables had to live far apart in separate dwellings. If the untouchables were near others, they had to sit apart from them. Untouchables were not allowed, of course, to touch people of, of the other four castes. They were not allowed to enter their homes. They were not allowed to touch their belongings. And if they did, there was an immediate thorough cleaning of them. Even if an untouchable, it was said, if their shadow mixed with your shadow it, and you were of a higher caste, it was considered polluting to you. And there was, of course, beatings and murder even of untouchables. And so this idea that we can't use the same wells, we can't use any of the same places, is the context in which this story occurred from 1924 to 1925 in Vaikam, India. In Vaikam, India, and it was forbidden for centuries for the untouchables to take the direct road to their homes because it passed by a Brahmin temple. And again, the Brahmins were the higher caste, the priests and the, the educated. They were orthodox in their belief system. 
And so in protest, the high caste reformers of the day joined with their friends who were untouchables. And they protested by walking that road and stopping at, in front of that temple. But the Orthodox Hindus attacked them, they arrested them, and they put them in prison. And so thousands of volunteers then gathered and walked that road in India in the support and the spirit of Satyagraha. The police set up a barricade so they couldn't go any further. And so when they met that barricade, they stood in prayer and asked the police if they could pass. And so there was this stalemate, this silence, the police on one side of the barricade, the reformers on the other side of the barricade that were standing in prayer. And they stood like this, the two sides, for a very, very long time. Everyone began to suffer on both sides after a while. The people ached from standing and praying. The policemen ached from holding up their guns, poised. And so there was just an overall kind of suffering happening in the whole area. Months went by, and Gandhi gave a speech to encourage the volunteers, and he said, do not blame the police or the Brahmins for their beliefs. Just stand firm in your own beliefs. He said three quarters of the world's miseries and misunderstandings would, would melt away if we could stand in the viewpoint, in the shoes of, of our so-called adversaries. So it's important that you don't blame them for having different beliefs than you. And this maybe buoyed up the volunteers for a little longer. They had quietly resolved that they were not going to give in, that they were going to really c continue to stand for the rights of the untouchables. So then the rainy season came, and people got really weary standing in the rain. Sometimes it was so high it was up to their shoulders, and people continued to stand on both sides around these barricades. So time went on, and eventually people started to just really outwardly suffer. A policeman began to weep. And one of the people who was praying on the other side of the barricade, his lips swollen with the heat of the sun, began to bless that policeman. And as they began to feel each other's pain, the barricade came down. One at a time, the policeman moved these sections of the barricade. But at that point, the volunteers had decided that they weren't going to just give in there, that they wanted to stand until the rights of the untouchables were understood and, and that there was a, a sense of equality. And so they continued their prayers. After 16 months, the Brahmins finally emerged from the temple. 16 months. And they said, we can't resist your prayers anymore we receive the untouchables. Sometimes that's what it takes. Resolve, but resolve to remain defenseless and open and grounded in our faith, in the power of our faith. So as we take that story in on a personal level, we can ask ourselves, what barricades of defense am I maintaining? Where am I holding up a barricade of defense between myself and anyone or anything? And could I, through prayer, melt my own heart? I've been in conversations with my sister Kay, who I've brought up a few times, and we have really different views on a lot of things that are going on in the world. And, you know, we have, uh, now we have different spiritual approaches. She introduced me to unity, but she's gone a much more conservative Christian route. And so when these conversations come up, sometimes it's really hard to stay in that defenseless place, you know? It's hard not to start to get to a place where we kind of are tossing things back and forth that we've heard in the news. It just, it's not helpful, <laughs> And it sort of dissolves the conversation, and then we agree not to talk about it right now. And uh, yesterday we were texting a little bit and agreed that next time we'll have an in-person conversation. But, you know, I really want to show up in that way that is defenseless and open and really understand, completely understand. 
And so if we can come to those, you know, just because we have different views doesn't mean we can't really listen from the heart, right? And really begin to understand one another. For a lot of us, when it's people who are close in our lives, it, we have a more vested interest in that, right? So I want to encourage you, if you have people in your life that are close to you especially, to really you know, open up to the possibility of that barricade that you might be holding between you and see if piece by piece you might remove it as you begin to feel the compassion on both sides, as you begin to understand that there aren't two sides, that we're walking together home, we're walking each other home, as, as that saying goes, you know, and that, that we need these diverse points of view, that this is all a part of it, but we won't know unless we are willing to open up and to really listen. And so that's the direction I think we really need to go. You know, there's a larger scope of violence that I'm already speaking to. A lot of times when we talk about violence, we think of physical violence in the world, right? And so we can kind of dismiss ourselves from that and say, well, I would never do that kind of physical violence. So, you know, I'm not, I, I don't have issues around being violent or not and don't need to be nonviolent. But of course, violence is so much more than that. We can be violent when we lash out at somebody. We can be violent when we shut down. We can be violent when we're even sarcastic. We can be violent in our words and our actions that are intended to hurt and protect, right? Protect ourselves and, and hurt someone else, perhaps. And so all of that is something that, that we can continue to work with. That's why Marshall Rosenberg, who started nonviolent communication, that's why he calls it nonviolent communication, a process of identifying our underlying feelings and needs and the other's feelings and needs so that empathy can reign in the conversation and connection can happen and this greater understandings can happen. As Gandhi said, three quarters of the world, if we could shift what a, what a blessing that would be. And so we can take the high road, you know, in our conversations, a way of being defenseless would be somebody calls you something or names something. They say you're, maybe you're unkind or you're naive or you're whatever they say, you know, <laughs> um, you're lacking compassion or, you know, whatever it is that, that, that you might get, get hear or, or feel from a coworker or a friend or a family member. And, and, and so instead of, you know, suddenly putting the defense up, Maybe we could just stay open and say, wow, thank you for that feedback. I'm going to really look at that. I take that to heart because I value your opinion. Could we take that high road? Can we lift? Yes, of course we can. Will we? I hope so. <laughs> because this is how we'll resolve a lot of our collective issues and personal issues and become more of the divine being that we've all come here to be. So as we take that high road, you know, that, that empathy, that, that process with nonviolent communication can be a really wonderful tool. If you're not familiar with it, you can look it up. There's lots of resources online. Um, and we even have a group that was meeting here. So we can see if they're willing to meet online as well. So it is through that open door that we can create a kinder, gentler, more um, significant impact together in our world. Taking heart, you know, taking heart means to, to sort of, you know, lift it up, so to see with a, a, with a more optimistic eyes what is possible, right? So if we take heart, and if we take heart, then, then we're doing the work in the heart, right? We're listening deeply from the heart. We're speaking from that space. So taking heart, if you can remember that term, maybe it'll remind you to sort of lift up from the heart and lift up the whole conversation and the whole process by taking that higher road. So it is with remaining open and steadfast, with booing ourselves up in our faith and our courage, just like those, those prayers, those people who are praying, standing behind that barricade, you know, that there is a steadfastness to that. There is a, a deep-rooted spiritualness in that. And refusing to go low, refuse to name call, refuse to get into that kind of stuff because it only goes downward, only spirals downward, right? It doesn't, it doesn't lift us up to where we want to be. It, doesn't, it isn't a taking heart kind of way to go. It's, it's m much more of the path of, of the egoic mind who sometimes wants to separate us. 
And if we vow then to take heart, to act from our divinity, to ground in our divinity, to speak from our divinity, that's the direction I think we all want to go. You know, they say it takes two to tango, right? And so if you're defenseless, if you're not willing to tango, then there isn't going to be that kind of dance. But if instead you're willing to turn the other cheek, and that's not an act of submission, it's actually an act of power. And it also, when we turn the other cheek, what do we do but see from another viewpoint, see from another perspective? And so it is with that kind of possibility that we begin a different kind of dance in life, a dance that can be beautiful and graceful, a dance that can be together in sync, so Heart Dream has this beautiful song for us called Dancing in the Light. Let's enjoy that.
beautiful song. Thanks to Mirabai and Steve and also to uh, Shari, D Shari Dyer who did the visuals for that, kind of let us dance through the forest. also want to give thanks to Peter Weiler who did those beautiful visuals uh, for our meditation time. So how do we dance? How do we dance in this light of freedom that we were just invited into? Well, one thing we can do is breathe, right? If we were dancing, we would be really clear about our breath. And that is the living breath of spirit that we have available to us at all times. And so just to breathe gives us a little bit of a pause when we are in the midst of conversation, perhaps, or practicing this idea of being defenseless. You know, the old the old conventional wisdom, count to 10, that works really, really well. If you're feeling angry, if you, I think, even breathe 10 times, right? And what that does for us, literally, uh, physiologically, it does something really important. It moves us from the reptilian brain, where we tend to lash out or say something that we will later regret, <laughs> to the prefrontal cortex, and in the prefrontal cortex, we have more of the wisdom and the, the uh, reasoning avail available to us. We're not in 100% emotional reaction. And we're in a more responsive place. So if we can just do those two things. Just remember to breathe maybe even 10 times before we respond and get comfortable with a little more silence in our conversations. That can go a really long way can summon our faith, right, to stand our spiritual ground, but in an open stance, not a, not a shield up kind of stance, but just an open stance, a willing stance, a knowing that God's got this, <laughs> and that we, grounded in that truth and that faith and that spirit, also have whatever it is that we need in order to build bridges, unite, work together instead of apart. So we can, as we said before, take heart, listen. And we can also, as with anything, we can get better at this. If we practice our skills at home, we'll be better out in the world. And if we practice our skills out in the world, we'll get better at home. So wherever it's most comfortable for you to begin to engage in some of this defenseless kind of interaction, do it there and get good at it. <laughs> and then maybe begin to bring it out into the world in 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 places that might be a little bit more challenging for you to have these kinds of interactions. So all of us today, of course, are together in this COVID thing, right? In COVID-19, we are all sort of united in this experience for better or for worse. And we can really learn from each other. So there's a story about Judith Hunt. She's a, a New Yorker, 80 years old. And she went to the hospital on January 31st. She went to the hospital after falling and breaking her femur and her hip. But while she was in the hospital, she also dealt with an aneurysm, sepsis, abdominal surgery, heart surgery. In March, three months into her stay in the hospital, she contracted COVID to top it off. And she was on a respirator for a while. And this woman with this indomitable spirit applied a sense of humor to her process 
applied a sense of gratitude. She said just she was so grateful for the doctors and the nurses and the aides and the, the people who cleaned her room. She said it gave her hope for humanity. And she, her humor was like, she said, you know, when all this was going on, she said at every turn there was something else and something else. And she said, I just said, you know, when is the rain of frogs coming? When will I get leprosy? <laughs> you know, she just had to use that kind of humor to help her just, you know, keep herself open and receptive. She said she accepted the fact that she was likely to die. But guess what? Six months later, she walked out of the hospital. And so now she's looking at, at moving in with some roommates and you know, it's just restarting her life. The doctors said that if I could replicate what Judith Hunt has, that attitude, he said it was her spirit, her attitude that really pulled her through. And he said, if I could replicate that with all my patients, I would do it in a heartbeat. So it's people like that who show us the way, common everyday people who show us how to not fight back and resist and, you know, defend. And, you know, often that's what we use when we hear about disease. We're going to fight it, right? But what if instead we just sort of opened up to the dance that is available to us to learn, to grow, to see, to move, to listen deeply to our bodies, to our minds, to our spirits? How much further might we get? How much more might we align like someone like Judith Hunt and even heal and walk free? So there are so many um, of these examples for us. And a lot of times they get buried in the news. You know, you have to go hunting a little bit, <laughs> so to speak. Her last name is Hunt, actually. Uh, you have to go hunting a little bit to find these. But these are the kinds of things that lift us up. And we're going to talk a little more next week about the kinds of things we take in. But if we had, if we lived in a defenseless world, what would that look like? What would that be like? We would, what if we had no weapons, but only tools like Judith Hunt? We would not dwell, I don't think, in the fears of conditions coming upon us. We wouldn't dwell in the fear of other. I don't believe that we would, um, I, I do believe that we would keep good humor, that we would stay in a space as much as possible of gratitude, of acceptance, of allowance. We would be skillful, I think, in our speech and our actions. We would learn to employ the skills of expressing our feelings when they arise rather than bottling them up so that there's some later explosion of anger or implosion of depression. Instead, we would get more skillful, right? These are the kinds of things that it w this is how our world would look without defense, with dropping some of these defenses. Our relationships would have more depth, more intimacy if we dropped our defenses. So let's just do it. <laughs> let's lay down those weapons. Let's lay down those weapons that are both literal and metaphorical. Because, you know, the last thing the world needs is more weapons. God's it, we're safe in God. We don't need those weapons. And instead, what we can pick up are the tools. As we drop our defenses, we pick up our faith. And as we pick up our faith, we walk in freedom. So let's really know this together. I invite you to just breathe, drop into your heart. And when you open your eyes and see this affirmation, let's really speak it in that place that resounds in our hearts and maybe something that you can work with throughout the week, which is always the intention of these affirmations, that it be something that lives for you and breathes for you throughout the week. Let's say it together. I drop my defenses, pick up my faith, and walk the road of freedom. God bless you all.